Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Victoria Rutter. I'm the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, um, and we're partners with SECT um, for the Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship. And for those of you with um, us yesterday, I'm sure that you will agree that it was a really great day of sharing and the fantastic work of all the partnerships. Um, the agenda for today is equally exciting and um, with some great keynotes lined up, um, as well as some space to discuss the sustainability of the projects and what's next on the horizon. Um, but before our first keynote, um, I'd first like to take just a, a few minutes to introduce the um, CPA and highlight um, the phenomenal collective um, achievements of all of the partnerships. Um, so, Beth, have you got some slides that you can put up to share? Thanks. Thank you. So, um, just very briefly, um, in case you don't know who we are, um, the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association is a charity. We were first set up in the 70s by the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. And uh, we're now independent since 2015. And our vision is to lead and develop the pharmacy profession across the Commonwealth. Next slide, please. Our mission is empower pharmacists to improve health and well-being throughout the Commonwealth in order to help reduce health inequalities, improve medicines related patient outcomes and promote healthier lifestyles. Next slide, please. These are um, some of our strategic goals. Um, so our strategic goals outlined here are to develop the pharmacy workforce and build capacity by advancing education and training, support pharmacists to strengthen healthcare systems through the safe and effective use of medicines, prevention of disease and promotion of healthier lifestyles, and advocate for and support the strategic embedding of pharmacists into all aspects of medicines management in order to improve access and quality of medicines. And these goals support um, the um, SDG3 um, around good health and well-being. Next slide, please. So the role of pharmacists in tackling AMR. Well, first of all, we are often the most accessible healthcare professionals in any healthcare system, able to give advice and, um, and access to medicines to, to patients in communities. We're experts in medicines um, and we are a key member of a multidisciplinary team enabling um, advice to be given on prescribing, uh, monitoring and um, side effects for medicines. We also facilitate appropriate access to medicines in many countries. And um, that's really been um, our strength in this programme as stewardship, the stewards of um, antimicrobials were often the gatekeepers, the final person that supplies that medicine. Um, and with the knowledge in, in medicines and our ability to advise teams on how to best use these medicines, we're really a key component to antimicrobial stewardship teams. And just want to highlight here a recent systematic review that's been done around pharmacists leading um, antimicrobial stewardship interventions and the outcomes of that was to recommend that um, all um, antimicrobial stewardship teams should consider taking pharmacists on because they really enhanced um, the success of these programs. So next, uh, next slide please. So how did this all come about and um, the Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship? Well I, um, I returned from Asia in 2016 and took up this role as the first executive director of the charity. And soon after that, I was introduced to Thet and Ben Sims and his team and um, the concept of um, health, the health partnership scheme. And I was immediately taken by this scheme because after being in Asia for 10 years and seeing experts come and go and often changes that just were not, were not sustained um, or pharmacists being sent out to other countries to learn, but coming back and not knowing how to implement um, changes. Um, so I was immediately taken by the health partnership scheme because of the bi-directional learning involved and the relationships that develop um, into a long-term um, relationship between institutions and individuals that can really help to embed learning and make sustainable changes. So at the same time, I had, um, discussions with the Fleming Fund due to our 
um, accredited status with the Commonwealth. We um, were involved in discussions with the Fleming Fund. And the Fleming Fund were very interested in how pharmacists could help to lead stewardship initiatives and help to promote, promote better use of antimicrobials in the Commonwealth. And really the health partnership scheme became my how. And I immediately phoned up Ben and said, look, we can, we can partner on this. It's, it's an ideal partnership because we've got the technical capacity and you've got the, the very long history of this excellent health partnership scheme, which we know produces excellent results. So that's really how CW PAMS was born. Um, and I think 20, uh, September 2018, we began these projects. Next slide, please. So just in case you are new to this or you missed yesterday, um, just a quick run through. CPAMS um, is a grants funded program um, funded by the, the government's, the UK government's Fleming Fund, managed by FET and, and ourselves, the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. And CPAMS has really leveraged the expertise, particularly in pharmacy, um, UK health institutions, volunteers and technical experts to strengthen the capacity of the national health workforce and institutions in four Commonwealth countries. And I think we have them all represented here today, so Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Ghana. The projects that we designed focused on antimicrobial stewardship, including surveillance, antimicrobial pharmacy expertise and, and capacity building, and also infection prevention control. Next slide, please. I just wanted to touch on and highlight some of the um, key collective achievements of the programme and the fact that these have happened even despite being in a pandemic, which is absolutely amazing. Um, here's some of the, the data that um, we have pulled out of our recent evaluation. Um, so some of the key highlights here are the number of healthcare workers trained here. You can see 3,300 healthcare workers trained um, in these four countries around AMS principles, antimicrobial prescribing, surveillance, and IPC. Um, not only that, we've demonstrated 96% of these healthcare workers have, dem have had improved knowledge after training. We've got a wealth of new or revised documents, guidelines, and protocols, and also um, 12 institutions that have collected and fed back on global point prevalence survey, which you know, for institutions that have never done this type of work before is a, is a real achievement. 80% um, of the institutions introduced the principles of who are where, antibiotic categories, and um, strategies used to ensure change um, are sustainable, sorry, strategies that um, certain things were introduced to ensure that sustainable changes um, were part of this program and that included establishing medicines and therapeutics committees, monitoring behavioural change and empowering AMS champions. 289 volunteers for, um, low, from lower middle income countries and the UK participated in this programme, which is a, a huge total of um, volunteering days, as you can see there, over 4,000. So a huge achievement. Um, the tools and resources developed as a result of this program um, are another big achievement, obviously, that we need to highlight. Um, I'm not going to go into these deep in detail now because my colleagues are going to cover these um, a bit later. So um, you can see here we've got things ranging from AMS checklist, point prevalence, survey support, um, and our own CPD platform and, and CWPAMS toolkit that we've developed in, in collaboration with that and the partnerships. Um, next slide, please. Um, but I guess the um, thing that perhaps we, we haven't been able to measure in, um, in its totality is um, the relationships that have developed from this and the bi-directional learning, which is the, the real um, key um, thing that I think the health partnership scheme has as, um, I'm sorry, um, I think that the relationships that are developed and the bi-directional learning are a real um, um, sorry. Um, I think you can see here from, from the slides that um, the teams worked very closely together um, both during the partnerships and um, in the run-up to the COVID-19 pandemic 
and you can see them learning from each other here how to produce the antibiotic um, um, antimicrobial hand sanitizer. And um, I think this bi-directional learning has been something that the teams will take away with them for the rest of their lives and as well as the relationships that they've developed, which is something that we really can't measure with data. Um, so next slide, please. And just to touch on the evaluation, and um, we just had an addendum published for the evaluation and really CPAMs um, pr performed excellently. Um, and as you can see, um, we've scored very good in terms of the criteria that we were measured against, which is a real, um, uh, which is really um, something that the team should be very proud of. So this leads me, I think, to introduce our first keynote speaker today. Um, so next slide, please. So C CPA have um, a very close relationship or, um, and are drawing closer to WHO. We have, um, uh, we're in official relationships with WHO and we have a collaborative work plan with them um, which involves promoting better use of antimicrobials around World, World Antimicrobial Awareness Week and also um, helping countries to implement their national action plans. And I know um, our next speaker has been following our work closely and his team have been very interested in, in this work. So without further ado, I'm introducing you to um, Dr. Thomas Joseph, the acting head of the Antimicrobial Stewardship and Awareness Department um, at the WHO. And um, Thomas, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Victoria. And maybe I can just start by congratulating you and your global team on what seem to be really amazing achievements, training thousands of pharmacists and developing all kinds of tools. Uh, I think it's really great. And I just want to say before I, you know, I start my presentation that we in WHO would be really interested in looking at the antimicrobial prescri prescribing app and seeing whether we can do something with it together and develop further applications for it. So please let's do that after this meeting sometime. Um, and thank you all for joining this meeting. Next slide. Uh, my uh, task is to speak a little bit about what we are doing in antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial awareness, uh, two parts of what which I lead in WHO. And I'm going to start next slide by reminding us, I think this is a familiar slide, I hope it is, but just reminding us of the complexity of antimicrobial resistance, the fact that drivers can be found not just in human health, but also in animal health, in plant health, in food, in feed, and in environment and what is discharged. And of course, in issues related to water sanitation and hygiene. In a sense, it's not just about acts of commission by us in terms of say misuse and overuse, but also of, of antimicrobials, but also of omission um, of not, you know, uh, having safe water, of not washing hands, of not keeping a clean environment, both in healthcare facilities as well as in communities. And these uh, uh, join together to fuel the antimicrobial uh, problem, which is fast becoming one of the world's biggest problems. Next slide, please. So uh, the context in which WHO decided to develop a guidance was the fact that its member states and to whom it is accountable asked for it, asked for guidance that would you know, be integrated, that would have a programmatic approach, that would be anchored in public health guiding principles, and that would somehow be comprehensive. And that's the task we attempted. Um, I have to say that many of uh, the members of the Commonwealth uh, Agency, uh, CWPAMS, were part of developing this policy guidance, and Diane in particular. Um, and there was a huge consultation worldwide with stakeholders from all over, uh, which resulted finally in a conference in December 
that then uh, allowed us to really make progress and develop this policy guidance on integrated antimicrobial stewardship activities in human health. Uh, so I, I emphasize that it is in human health. We're taking one bit to chew on because uh, AM, AM, AMS, of course, affects all the other sectors as well. Next slide, please. And I want to just sort of try first to focus our attention on what it is that is different, new or important. And I think what is important and new maybe is the fact that our definition not just talks about proper diagnosis and improved patient of, uh, outcomes, not only speaks of access and appropriate use of quality and affordable antimicrobials, not only emphasizes the need to select the optimal drug regimen, dosing, duration, route of administration, but also, I think for the first time, talks about needing to prevent infections as an integral part of stewardship. Next slide, please. So this is the, a, a picture of the cover of the WHO policy guidance, and it's available online. If you Google it, you'll find it hopefully immediately. Um, and I just want to quickly read out the key elements of the definition, which is what I've put in uh, this very busy slide. But the first set is talking about responsible and appropriate use of antimicrobials as the core. And it then talks about that meaning that it's prescribed only when needed, that the drug regimen is optimal, that it is also the drug dosing and route of administration that are optimal, as well as the duration of treatment. So we are emphasizing optimal drug regimen, dosing, duration, administration, and of course, proper and optimized diagnosis. And then finally, we emphasize that these actions are complemented by a access to affordable and quality antimicrobials because the lack of access can fuel poor behavior, but also that it includes the implementation of the four elements of IPC and WASH. This is really important. And finally, that it also includes optimizing the coverage of vaccinations because as you know that could prevent infections in the first place. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, the core elements of the antimicrobial stewardship policy in terms of its purpose and its tar target audience. I've spoken about that purpose to respond to the demand from member states and to really provide a set of evidence-based considerations to them. And the target audience therefore is almost everyone that is involved in actions that are uh, particularly at the policy level, uh, such as policymakers at Ministry of Health, national antimicrobial resistance coordinating bodies, other equivalent national authorities who are responsible for AMR in the human health sector. And of course, in many countries, that means also the devolved subnational authorities where health is a state subject uh, and the decision makers, technical experts and stakeholders supporting antimicrobial resistance at all levels. So this is whom the policy as a whole is, is geared towards. Uh, next slide, please. And it talks about five pillars. Um, the package, the public health package we have seen is really important. And that package that we are propagating has five pillars, the first of which is to establish and develop national coordination mechanisms for antimicrobial stewardship in particular, and to develop guidelines. So where they exist, the idea is that we will strengthen them. And where they don't exist, the idea is that we will help to develop them. But every country should have a mechanism and these mechanisms should develop the guidelines, the standards, the tools, and so on. The second pillar is to ensure access to antimicrobials and of course also regulation. And that could include regulating the kind of triggers, social triggers and remuneration policies that promote responsible antimicrobial prescribing and dispensing behaviors. So as we know, often there are a push 
factors coming from patients for antimicrobials that are not needed. There are push factors coming from representatives of pharma. Uh, there are other issues about stocks that need to be used and so on. So we need to have a robust regulation mechanism in addition to the access so that um, responsible and appropriate use becomes even more common than it is now. The third pillar is improving awareness, education, and training. And this includes all stakeholders. I know that CW PAMS is doing a lot in this area, and I'm really happy to see that. But everyone else, everyone needs to do more. Uh, we really need to strengthen the capacity of health workers um, and provide them with the kind of tailored education and training packages that will help them. That includes all sorts of providers, including pharmacists, uh, who need to have a better understanding uh, of say things like AWARE and you know why is it classified in these three different categories and why should we use access antimicrobials more than watch and reserve and so on. So we need to do much more along those lines. The fourth pillar is strengthening WASH and IPC. And this is all about prevention and the fact that these are no longer seen as separate, but these are integral and in the sense that they complement the work of antimicrobial stewardship. And finally, around the whole area of surveillance, monitoring and evaluation. So we know what we're doing and we are able to monitor it and we are able to uh, learn from what we're doing. Next slide, please. I think, uh, the more final point I'm going to make on stewardship is that, you know, all this is fine, but the most important aspect, of course, is implementation. So we need nation states to actually develop locally appropriate, contextually relevant national policy, and they can use our global guidance for reference, but they need national policies. Uh, and they need to do the kind of baseline assessment and situational analyses that will be necessary. They need to either establish or strengthen the mechanisms of coordination that will support multi-stakeholder engagement in antimicrobial stewardship. They need to develop costed implementation plans because otherwise we're talking about pies in the sky. So a budget that is supported by government is important. And they should then of course secure the human financial resources that will allow that budget to be managed must focus on advocacy and awareness raising always because this is a growing area and it's an area in which ignorance is still more uh, uh, prevalent than awareness and knowledge. Um, we need therefore also to develop new training materials and training uh, for different stakeholders, including pharmacists, and always monitor and evaluate. As WHO, we are committed to developing a training manual of the, on the global guidance, and we are committed to training and empowering consultants so that they can uh, help member states uh, and their committees and their coordination mechanisms to progress forward. Next slide, please. I'm going to now move quickly into the area of awareness. And the mandate, of course, for increasing awareness, uh, while obvious, also comes from the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance. The first objective is to improve awareness and understanding of AMR through effective communication, education, and training. And today I'm going to focus on one subject. Next slide, please. Uh, because awareness is a you know, huge area again, but I want to really ask all of you to consider participating in what is called the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Uh, our objective for WOW, if you don't mind my using that word, WOW, uh, is to make it everyone's business, uh, to make it not just the business of WHO or healthcare providers or pharmacists or patients, but everyone to be united. Everyone in the world needs to unite to preserve antimicrobials, unite to prevent drug resistance. We can only succeed if we all work together. Now, next slide, please. Until last year, until 2019, it was called the World Antibiotic Awareness Week, and it had a limited audience and limited number of stakeholders engaging. So last year in 2020, we made some key decisions. One, we decided that 
it needs to be fixed in perpetuity to the same dates every year. So people can plan well in advance. So from 2020, the dates for WOW are 18th to 24th of November. You can keep this in your diaries and you can plan for it for this year, for next year, for the year after. It will not change. These are the WOW dates. And also the, uh, in 2020, we made the decision to change the name from World Antibiotic Awareness Week to World Antimicrobial Awareness Week so that people understand that resistance is growing not just in antibiotics, but also in others such as antivirals, antifungals, antiparasitics. And this is important because these are new problems of the 21st century. The medicines of the 20th century are beginning not to work. And this can cause huge um, burdens in terms of morbidity and mortality. Um, together with uh, the World Organization for Animal Health and the World and the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, we agreed last year a common slogan for all sectors, which is handle antimicrobials with care. In 2021, we intend to continue to push this message and perhaps even for several years forward, because the idea is to make it familiar and to make everyone uh, uh, understand how they can play a role in handling antimicrobials with care so that we preserve it for ourselves and for future generations. Next slide, please. So the core strategy for 2021 for WOW is to make WOW everyone's business, to widen it and to deepen first the transition from antibiotics to antimicrobials. We want to engage all our member states. We also want to engage other UN agencies who have traditionally not been part of the discussion on AMR to engage civil society organizations, as well as to engage the private sector. All, of, all the different stakeholders need to be engaged, and of course, the public uh, as a whole. But we also want to uh, collaborate with other UN campaigns. So during the week, we have World Toilet Day, and you can immediately see that uh, ideas around sanitation, ideas around hygiene can be very well communicated during World Toilet Day that will help the cause of antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. Universal Children's Day is celebrated on the 20th of November, and that's a great opportunity to get uh, children to engage with messages about washing hands, keeping a clean environment and so on, and talking about not using antibiotics when not indicated, um, um, especially for viral infections. And as you know, COVID has caused an epidemic in terms of, uh, I don't know what the word is, but it has caused a huge increase in the use or the unnecessary use of antibiotics, simply because physicians are afraid uh, that there might be bacterial infections that they haven't caught, and then it's being given as prophylaxis, which is really driving resistance further. I think evidence for this is slowly developing, and we might see papers about it in the next uh, several months. But also other campaigns during the year that ask people to be responsible consumers and uh, dispensers of antimicrobials. Uh, finally, uh, we are going to launch this year the One Health Partnership Platform on AMR, which brings together all the different stakeholders on a public platform. You will all be given the opportunity to apply for membership and to be part of this partnership platform. You will see soon an announcement an advertisement asking for your views on it. Um, and just like last year, we launched the Global Leaders Group on AMR. This year, we're going to try and launch the partnership platform that brings civil society, private sector, governments, funding agencies, multilateral agencies, intergovernmental agencies, everybody together to have a joint conversation that hopefully will result in a shared vision and a shared narrative that allows us to really uh, forge forward together. So that uh, is a sort of continuing global advocacy that we hope to have. Next slide, please. And I come now to the end of my presentation. I've said all this There's about antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial awareness. But the bottom line, as you know, is about behavior change. We can educate patients. We can educate pharmacists. We can educate physicians. We can educate all of them. But ultimately, it's up to them to find ways in which they change their behavior. They start moving in the direction in which they're educated. One doesn't necessarily lead to the other. 
But this is a huge topic perhaps for another day. Thank you. Last slide. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. And um, that was a really um, in informative talk and um, really appreciate you um, attending today to deliver your keynote. Um, I think um, it's worth just mentioning those dates for World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, the 18th to 24th of November. So in case any of you missed those, um, I know CPA always runs a very active social media campaign supporting um, the messages that WHO are putting out during that week. Um, and I think it would be great if um, you know all, all of the people on this call today can um, sort of get behind that and, and the WHO's messaging during that time to raise awareness. Um, and you touched on behavioural change as well at the end, which is you know an essential component to um, our programmes and something that we try to embed um, you know throughout. And I think it, it's very really key for us moving forward that we continue to do that. Um, and the policy guidance that you shared, I'm aware that then several of um, our team have been involved in developing that. And it's an excellent document. Um, and we've used the checklist um, in our current scoping um, program. And we will um, seek to embed that into um, our programs moving forward. So um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of reflect on that to say how useful it's been for us. So thank you very much for your um, talk. Um, and I think it's time for us to move on to our next keynote. Um, Dr. Keith Ridge, CBE. Um, Keith is the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer for England. Um, he's been a huge supporter of the CPA for many years um, and his support was integral um, for the um, development of the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer's Global Health Fellows um, scheme that ran alongside um, CWPAMS. Um, so Keith, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Vicky, and hello, everybody. Um, uh, and thanks very much for asking me to um, to present today. Um, um, firstly, I'd like to say um, the program, the um, Commonwealth uh, Partnerships AMS program, has exceeded all our expectations. Actually, and I congratulate you all on that. And indeed, I understand yesterday um, it was announced that uh, it will continue with more funding. So. More congratulations, so that's very good. Um, I actually began my own involvement um, with AML policy in the 1990s. Indeed, I've worked, indeed had the pleasure to work with uh, four UK government chief medical officers on AMR. And I'm glad to say that over that period, the role of pharmacists in antimicrobial stewardship has grown from interested party to leaders in the field. Indeed, last year I appointed a senior and experienced AMR pharmacist, um, who's Kieran Hand, who many of you I suspect will know, as the national AMS pharmacy and prescribing lead for the NHS across England. Uh, he's supported by seven new regional leads, all pharmacists, as part of the UK's latest AMR strategy, uh, building on the growth in specialist uh, AMS uh, pharmacists over the years. Of course, it's Sally Davis, um, my third uh, CMO, um, who has made and continues to make an enormous contribution uh, and impact on how the world approaches AMR. But both Sally and I know um, that it's early to mid-career, um, early to mid-career professionals that in the end will drive healthcare forwards. So when the opportunity came to um, help improve AMS in, in some lower and middle-income countries through um, the Fleming funded uh, CPA and Fair Partnership Programme. There was no question at all that it was going to receive my full support. I also hoped and believed that the pharmacists involved should in due course become the kernel, if you like, of the future of UK of UK's UK pharmacies expanded contribution to global health matters in the future. Working to combat AMR can feel a bit like a lonely struggle sometimes, and there can be no doubt um, that resilience is essential uh, to survival. But the key to success and, and moving from surviving to thriving is, is inspiring others and building networks of supporters and champions to take up the cause and share the burden. Um, how would you describe the essential skills and personality traits of a future senior leader in AMS or AMR? What, do, what, what would you need? Um, 
when I say we, I mean citizens, patients, the health service, and indeed our profession. We need people with a combination of unshakable self-belief and natural authority, balance with humility, empathy, and respect, both for patients and for fellow health professionals. We need individuals with self-awareness and emotional intelligence who can clearly communicate and inspire others with a shared sense of purpose. Um, sensitive to the priorities that others and, and the challenges that they may face, but committed to finding common goals and reaching them. We need subject matter experts, respected by their peers across professions, both for their knowledge, but also their integrity, their passion and commitment, to continuously improving quality of care for patient, uh, quality of care and improving patient outcomes. We need team players who listen to and value the contribution of every member of the multidisciplinary team, and encourage and encourage the sharing of knowledge and experience in a in a collegiate environment. We need innovators with can-do attitudes who can make the most of limited resources, and we need role models who win hearts and minds in uh, hearts and minds with their sort of limitless uh, energy and infectious so to speak enthusiasm it was for these reasons that i suggested the global health Part, uh, global health fellowship scheme uh, um, uh, to run alongside um, the main program if you like and and i'm very grateful to health education england and uh, the Centre for Pharmacy Postgraduate Education and Chris Cutts, Matthew Shaw and Jed Byrne in particular for helping to make the fellowships happen. That scheme has also exceeded um, all expectations and delivered alumni who display a remarkable and objectively measured improvement in all of these skills and behaviours essential to be effective in a senior AMS AMR role and to ultimately have a greater impact on patient outcomes bringing enormous benefits to employer organisations as well as to the wider NHS, to public health, and of course our uh, lower um, um, and middle income uh, partner organisations. Almost without exception, their seniors uh, viewed their fellows as ready for a more senior role, and many remarked on their positive influence on the wider department that they worked in and, and indeed beyond. The evaluation of both the um, overall programme and the fellowships has provided evidence which shows the benefits to be far reaching and sustained. Helping to combat AMR through good AMS must be at the heart of what clinical pharmacy teams do. Working as part of broader multidisciplinary teams, of course, and very, very importantly in partnership with patients and citizens, where shared decision making is central to professional practice. The programme has helped embed stewardship in our partner hospitals in low income settings and also improved the way we look at stewardship in the NHS. It's demonstrated beyond question the many and varied benefits of having pharmacists as key players and leaders in our health systems. As the programme um, was entering its final uh, few months, um, of course, the pandemic arrived. Many activities had to be cancelled, including my own planned visit to the partnerships in, in Ghana. We offered, we offered the partnerships an option to pause activities um, to allow our volunteers to focus on their dis domestic responses. Many of their teams were managing the um, COVID responses in, in their own hospitals. However, instead, the volunteers chose to step up the communication with their partner hospitals at that time and work together to support and learn from each other as the world tackled this global pandemic. Individually and collectively, the programme teams worked on contingency plans and ways to reduce the impact of the pandemic. Relationships had to be built and partnerships really stepped up in these times and provided key support. And this support went both ways. So, for example, one partnership had already established an alcohol-based hand rub manufacturing facility in Zambia, but managed to increase output five times by five times overnight um, during the pandemic. In addition, this initiative was then replicated by Brighton and Sussex Medical School in the UK. It supplied um, hospitals in Brighton. Uh, in March and April when the COVID deaths were doubling every three days. 
uh, an anim animation video was made together with training videos to support um, hospital pharmacy teams manufacture hand rubbing in in-house. You can of course find that on the CPA website. Another partnership found ways to ensure accurate information was shared um, about both antimicrobials and COVID on local radio stations at community events. This included dispelling myths and inaccurate information and reminding patients and communities that antibiotics are ineffective against viruses. Learning from this has also informed our challenges around communicating with all citizens the information that is needed to improve health. Reaching and communicating with their patients uh, in their languages and using language and using language that is culturally and contextually relevant to them is essential in, as is as essential in the UK as it is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Program volunteers have learned a huge amount from their counterparts, uh, and this has helped volunteers understand these challenges and work together to find ways to address them and share this learning widely. There are many more examples and they all demonstrate precisely why the work is so crucial and why this model of partnership and collaboration works in global health projects. Leaders in the NHS and other part others in partner hospitals, or hospitals have commented that the individuals involved with these partnerships were better prepared than many to handle the challenges that COVID offered. Uh, Ability to uh, think innovatively and quickly in a crisis, managing shortages of PPE, medicines or hand rub, or even just understanding and having the confidence to use digital, techno digital technology for meetings and using digital platforms, including the, uh, the programmes app itself to inform prescribing decisions where they are needed at the point of prescribing. With AMR, there is still much to do and stewardship is one effective solution. Through this program and by combining clinical practice with evaluation, we now have the evidence for stewardship interventions in these settings. This will help policy and decision makers as they work together to consider interventions that will help tackle AMR. I guess we are all concerned that there might be a COVID legacy of losing some of the AMS gains of recent years with what some might see as excessive use of antibiotics. But public health and the importance of vaccination programmes has never been so high profile and pharmacists have been on the front line and crucially behind the scenes making this happen. All pharmacists and all health professionals need to promote vaccination whilst guarding against inappropriate antibiotic use in the months and years ahead. The risk of AMR remains, hence the UK's um, 20 year vision and five year national action plan, which are still as important as ever. Indeed, AMR national action plans continue to be an important priority wherever we live. And, and when we emerge from the pandemic, it would, be, do, it would do no harm whatsoever to remind decision makers about the risks of AMR. I certainly am. It may not appear as imminent as the risk from COVID, but as we see COVID, um, uh, you know, with COVID, the COVID virus, just like that, bugs travel, uh, and that includes the, uh, those that are resistant to antibiotics. So pharmacists with experience of seeing and helping with the challenges of stewardship in low and middle income uh, countries will be invaluable. As I conclude these few, few words, I must also pay tribute to the CPA and to Thet. The CPA has always been on my mind across my career, and I've seen the important work it does. But it's been uh, this programme that has drawn me closer to the, CPA, uh, uh, to the CPA itself, and I can't congratulate them enough in proposing the pro programme, securing funding uh, through the Fleming Fund and in partnership with FET, see and seeing um, it through to successful conclusion and now extended. THET um, was a new body to me. As I've got to know THET a little more and Ben Sim, Sims and his team and seen a little of the amazing work they do and the distinguished history of a dedicated organisation, there is no doubt in my mind that as many pharmacists as possible should, should, particularly when we can all travel freely again, consider spending some time working abroad in low and middle income countries to help develop expertise um, needed. 
but also bring back that experience to the NHS. Of course, you need a willing, a willing NHS employer and line manager to support this. So thank you to any chief pharmacists that are in the audience for supporting your staff's development. And I hope you agree it brings advantages to your organisation too. And finally, a big thank you to Sarah, Diane and Vicky and to the FET team and for the superb leadership they have demonstrated in making the scheme happen. Well done uh, and congratulations again to all the partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, we really, really appreciate your continued support and um, also for sharing with us our vision on NHS's um, NHS pharmacist involvement in, in global health as well. Um, I think the benefits back to the NHS for the pharmacists involved in CPAMS have been um, immense, if you, as you've highlighted, and certainly ex exceeded all of our expectations. And um, the resilience, leadership and innovative approaches that volunteers have developed as a result of their involvement here um, is really phenomenal. And as you've highlighted, timely in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you for a fantastic speech. Um, this leads very nicely to introduce our next two speakers who um, are really um, embodiments of the resilience, leadership and innovation that um, Keith has mentioned. And I think two of the very best pharmacists that we have produced in the UK. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Diane Ashiru Orido, our global AMR lead. Um, Diane has many hats. Um, I often joke with her that she must have a body double because she does so much. She's very passionate about pharmacists and AMR um, and this program. Um, she's been the driving force behind our technical input. Um, she's gone above and beyond um, every day. Um, I, can't, I can't thank you enough, Diane, for what you've done. And um, she's joined with, by Sarah Kavanagh, who is our international partnerships lead. Sarah also has another job. Um, and which she's had to juggle um, amongst very various other things. And um, she's been a real um, asset to the partnerships and um, definitely um, helped to develop those relationships um, and, and been a, a key component to the success of this programme. So Diane and Sarah are gonna take you through some of the tools and resources that we've developed as a result of um, the programmes. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Diane and Sarah. Thank you, Vicky. Hopefully you can hear me and you can see my screen. It's all right. Just before I get started, so um, as Vicky said, I'm Diana Shuridope, and um, as well as well as myself at this presentation, Sarah Kavanagh will also be presenting. I will start off, then I'll hand over to Sarah, and then um, it will come back to me again. Um, you've all been sit sat listening to us, and just so that you know, we I know that you're still awake and with us. If I just get you to put into the chat very quickly, please, um, some of the tools and resources that you use within your practice for antimicrobial stewardship or tackling AMR. So it does not have to be CW Pam's tools, but what tools have you found useful in your quest to tackle AMR? If I could just get some, um, some um, examples put into the chat, that would be really helpful. And then I can read some of those out. And in this session, I'm going to focus on some of the data you heard yesterday when, um, for those of you who um, joined us yesterday with, um, Dr. Tom Pilcher talking about CW PAMS really um, focusing on using data for action. So we collect data, but we ensure that that data is used back for action. We also developed a range of programmatic tools. We're very keen that the tools that we developed, that, that partnerships were not reinventing the wheel and where we could pull together um, uh, resources and develop tools at a programmatic level or resources, we did that. Um, and so some of what I'll be sharing with you today is some of the data from that and then going back. So what I've got, start smart then focus. I can see colleagues from, um, from the UK typing in. Thank you, microguide app, um, WHO checklist for AMR structures. Thank you. So that's a uh, microguide app. So I can see colleagues from Uganda talking about that, talking about networks and point prevalence tools. Those are really, really helpful and important tools. 
a BSAC ebook. Thank you. Um, I can see one from Uganda around um, the Ministry of Health Medicines Therapeutic Committee manual. I think that that's what that is. Point prevalence, micro guide app, and clinical guidelines, and more about global PPS and eBug. Excellent. Thank you, eBSAC courses. Thank you very much. So please do feel free to continue sharing there. So what we'll share with you are those that focused from CW Pumps, but there are a wealth of tools are available. And in one of the tools and resources that I will share with you, we are highlights where we've collated some of these resources. So um, Vicky went through this earlier, so um, I'm just going to very briefly touch on this for those of you that missed the start of the, the, um, of the, of the day, really high, reminding us that there were 12 partnerships, five in Ghana, one in Tanzania, five in Uganda, one in Zambia. So as we were developing these tools, we were really thinking about what could work and how could we bring together tools that would be useful across four countries. And actually, as you'll hear me talk about a little bit later, now eight countries. Um, when we were developing the tools and um, particularly how we collect data, we were trying to ensure that um, they, were, uh, they were applicable across all settings. And a couple of the tools that I will share with you need to highlight that they were developed before WHO published their tools in um, 2018. Um, and so we went back using international consensus and then got feedback from colleagues um, across the four countries. Really key to us was also the importance of behavior change strategies. And how did we know what tools and interventions to, we needed to develop? We carried out a scoping, a, a desk-based scoping, as well as focus group discussions with colleagues across the four countries at the inception of CWPAM. So as soon as we knew that, and even before, whilst we were pulling together the, the, the programmatic pl um, plans for the, the project, we were starting to scope and understand where the gaps were and where we could really make a difference and support. Uh, there's a strong focus on behavior change um, and behavior change strategies in health psychology is a it's a it's a profession in itself um, and so I, I cannot you know we cannot give you the full information but one thing to highlight is that throughout CWPAMS we're constantly thinking about what strategies the, the strategies that we put in place how can they change behavior and I know that Dr Joseph that was his last slide highlighting that all well and good to have tools resources but what's really key is how do we change behavior and very briefly when we talk about changing behavior this is the Michi Combi um, model that is often used we're thinking about capability and motivation and an opportunity and just to give you a very very simplified way to think about this um, so capability is about um, people's understanding or their ability so their, their training to be able to carry out a task motivation is that they have that reflective or automatic wanting to do it and opportunity is that there is there is a there is on there is well this, as i say it's opportunity for them to do it so i'll give you an example so um hand washing is an example we want people to wash hands. We want healthcare workers to wash their hands. They know the reasons why they need to wash their hands. They've been taught, they know the background, they know the evidence and the importance of washing hands. That's the capability. They're motivated because they want to ensure their patient safety and for the safety of their colleagues. So that's motivation. Opportunity is that, do they have clear, um, do they have opportunities? Do they have hand washing resources available? Do they have water? Do they have um, wash basins? Or are the wash basins actually nearby for them to be able to wash their hands? That's where the opportunity comes in. So you can see that you can have the capability and motivation, but if you don't have the opportunity, for example, in the resources, then the behavior will not happen. So that's a very simplified way of thinking about that. So through this all, we were um, thinking about behavior change strategies, and we had colleagues from the Change Exchange in Manchester who were um, very much supportive within individual partnerships, but also we drew on them at different stages um, for support. So in terms of data for action, what are some of the programmatic things that we had? The first was developing an antimicrobial stewardship checklist or assessment. So what is the state of, as, was of antimicrobial stewardship within the individual institutions that we were going into? We encouraged individual partners to um, use the checklist, but to develop that checklist in the first instance, we used an international consensus 
And then we went back to colleagues in um, the UK, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and Ghana to help refine those, those co the contents of the international consensus. And we ended up with 54 items that was then used across all 12 partnerships, but actually in 14 institutions because a couple of the partnerships were working in more than one hospital setting. So the aim, it was across seven core elements around senior management leadership, um, available expertise, um, actions aiming to at responsible use of antimicrobials, monitoring and surveillance, um, as well as accountability and responsibility. As you can see the range, the education and training was quite key as well. So there were a range of questions. I'm just gonna to touch on 54 items as I highlighted. I'm gonna to touch on very, uh, uh, just a few of those um, indicators. So this um, is an example here from the baseline versus the post CWPAM. So there was an assessment done at the beginning and then an assessment again done at the end. And you can see there that for all the indicators, there was an increase in um, activity post CWPAMs. One of the ones where there was um, where there was uh, the, the 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 range of um difference was was shorter was around infection prevention and control protocols and we knew that because actually there have been several ipc um projects and programs across multiple countries and we discovered that through the um the scoping and whilst this cw pumps focused on antimicrobial stewardship we all know that to tackle antimicrobial resistance you need both infection prevention and control because if you prevent the infections in the first instance, you also reduce the need for antimicrobials. So, um, but what was really key was a majority of all the partnerships somehow embedded IPC principles within them. And actually, and I think in one or two of the, um, the partnerships, they actually um, were focused on that opportunity, which is around um, purchasing resources that could support um, improving opportunities for people to um, improve their IPC um, practices. We then asked, uh, so another section we asked was around what happened as a direct result of CW PAMs. And you can see there that um, quite a majority of the, uh, for these indicators, majority happened as a result of CW PAMs directly. So, for example, um, establishing or re establishing or establishing a new functioning antimicrobial stewardship team, embedding a pharmacist within that team, having functional um, formal organization for um, responsible for antimicrobial stewardship. For some of these, they revived um, the stewardship committee. For some, they linked it to um, infection prevention and control um, committees. And for some, um, it was linked to the medicines therapeutics committee. So I've highlighted there that we developed the, the tools um, as part of CW PAMS, but since then, the WHO obviously um, has developed, um, first of all, published um, healthcare facility assessment tool, and there is now the national assessment tool. And Vicky highlighted that we've piloted the national assessment tool as part of our scoping, which I'll talk about later. Um, but, but going forward, um, in, in, what we will be looking at is how do we support facilities to use the WHO healthcare facility assessment tool. We may need to do some adaptation again, um, just to make sure that it's context specific and country specific, but we'll work through that process over time. Another um, specific around data was around um, measuring antimicrobial use and the Fleming Fund is really, um, it's uh, surveillance is a key part of the Fleming Fund and so for us measuring antimicrobial use was critical. In terms of measuring my, um, anti um, antimicrobial resistance, so the bug, um, there was there was other, re, um, other projects and um, grants who focused on that, ours focused on antimicrobial use. And so before that, only one institution um, in any of the four countries had contributed to the global PPS. We chose the global PPS at that time because it was the tool available. Again, um, the WHO PPS was not yet published. And also, as you'll see later, there are several um, advantages with the global PPS when you're using it in an individual institution and you want to develop um, your own interventions. Um, and, and WHO um, PPS focuses on a national level and, what, and providing data at, that, at the national level in, in that context. Um, and you can see here some of the data that we have, which is around the WHO aware categories. So that's the access, watch, and reserve. And for those that are not aware, uh, that are not, <laughs> for those of you that may not be um, as familiar, access is really the narrow spectrum, very briefly, the narrow spectrum and first line antimicrobial antibiotics. Watch are the um, next stage, which are often more broad spectrum. 
and more have a higher risk for resistance and reserve are those anti antibiotics that we really want to be the last line antibiotics and you can see there that more than 50 percent almost 60 percent in some countries were from the aware categories and then uh, a, a, another proportion from watch and none from the um, reserve category. There are some concerns around that. It may be due to act, lack of access and um, more so than actually um, the fact that they the um, appropriate use in, in the general sense. So we do need to I'll constantly think about access um, versus excess when we're thinking about antimicrobials in the context of colleagues in um, low middle income countries. So in terms of antimicrobial stewardship, one of the key points we also um, highlighted, and this, please, I would appreciate if this is not tweeted because this will be going into a manuscript. Um, this um, slide here just shows the range of interventions that colleagues across the different hospitals um, undertook as a result of um, the, their point prevalence survey. And you can see they ranged from a catalyst from forming a stewardship committee to um, drug charts being updated, antibiograms being developed. All of them presented the data back to clinicians, some presented back to the AMS committee and drugs and therapeutics committee. So really important to, and also a quality improvement projects being developed as well. So really important that we are developing and using that data for action. And we really encourage the partnerships to do that. Um, and obviously the key part between this is that there was a partnership between UK colleagues and who had more experience in carrying out point prevalence survey. So training colleagues and working alongside colleagues who are now able to carry out both global PPS or WHO PPS um, for, for, from now and into the future. Um, and this is just another example from one of the CW Palms projects. Again, appreciate um, this slide is again um, going under peer review at the moment. So just showing a quality improvement methodology from um, one of the partnerships in Ghana um, uh, from the SAB-G partnership. This is published and again it's from another Ghana, um, Ghana um, partnership but and what this shows here is um, the, their data from the global PPS and the actions that they went on to do uh, were quite um, impressive around and they focused on surgical prophylaxis and, and improving access to guidelines because again they realized that guideline compliance was low and also that um, guidelines were missing. In terms of tools and resources that we developed, um, the app, so I know Dr. Joseph talked about the app earlier. Um, so we did, uh, we do, using the experience we have from the UK, we developed a, a mic, a, an app using the microguide tool um, as, as a microguide platform as our basis. And we now have national treatment guidelines from Ghana, Tanzania, Zambia, and Uganda available through the, through the app. Um, it includes the National Standard Treatment Guidelines, WHO Essential Medicines List, Infection Prevention and Control Resources, Point Prevalence Tools, and other stewardship tools as well. We're working through the, uh, of this period of time to update the app and to think about, and we've been engaging with stakeholders in Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone to identify their interests, and also how can we explore the use of this for community pharmacy. And these has come across because of a uh, um, uh, we 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 applied for uh, uh, we were put through for a competition and one of the advice we got back was around expanding it to community. We also assess the um, healthcare workers and patients use of the of the um, of the guidelines and one of the points that we were told was that patients may find that patients may be worried about their their healthcare professionals being being um, on the mobile phones while they're while they're treating them and what the patient said was that they they had a positive attitude to that and we also created posters to highlight to patients the importance of the healthcare professionals looking at a, a guideline um in whilst treating them and more than half 80 percent of the healthcare workers found the app useful and that improved their awareness of antimicrobial stewardship what we didn't expect was that actually a majority of the users were pharmacists and nurses who felt empowered to be able to challenge inappropriate antimicrobial prescribing. We've developed a toolkit which which collated all the resources for um from CW Pam. So all the amazing resources that colleagues um, um uh, developed as part of the CW Pam's project, we now have a toolkit that is available that collates all that in one place as a legacy document that can be used by any colleagues um in any of the countries and abroad. And examples for those is that um 
the toolkit includes case studies um, and also, you know, so if you're wanting to create a committee, if you're wanting to start a, start a new antimicrobial stewardship committee, there are examples of the templates, terms of reference that you may want to use there. And we also created an, um, a, a collation of all the online free access training resources that we could find online in that toolkit. Over the last few months, the CW PAMS, as you know, was a specific time period. It was slightly extended and we've been working through now um, some projects to really scope about the next phase and, and and you'll see in the next in the session later on today when Louise talks to that what that involves but in the meantime we have been scoping um, on a range of things and I'll just go through them now we've we've done some scoping studies in eight countries updating the previous scoping reports from that we had from the four countries and then into four new countries Kenya Malawi Nigeria and Sierra Leone and we know that we have colleagues from those countries here um, and we have used um, evidence synthesis as our method and we have also had focus groups discussions and as I mentioned we used the pilot of the WHO um, country assessments and we will then develop eight country level documents so each country will have a, a scoping report and then we'll have a summary document an executive summary to highlight um, the key findings from the scoping so the, the research team have done an enormous amount of work doing going through the literature and then how us going through a focus group discussions with colleagues across amr committees as well as um as well as um other colleagues across the different countries making sure that we are reflecting what is useful and what is su supportive for um, each of the countries there are also training resources that have been developed and one of them is scoping for the cw pams um, leadership program and this is really around um, how do we support pharmacists to lead within their workplace. So Dr. Keith Rich talked about the fellowship scheme, which is for the UK pharmacists. And we learned very quickly from that, the importance of also creating leadership and programs. And CP has been thinking about this for a while and CW Pumps has provided a clear um, a catalyst for us to be able to develop a leadership program focused on uh, building antimicrobial stewardship leadership within with African with colleagues with pharmacy colleagues in, in across eight African countries at the moment this is a, only a scoping and this is just a result from the scoping highlighting the majority of those that contribute um, contributed to the survey um, almost 500 of them many of them had not previously been part of a leadership program and for those that had they found it highly beneficial or beneficial so we are working through a range of activities at the moment and a range of um through focus group discussions as well and developing a program of what this may look like and we're now trying to seek funding to be able to make this happen so that we can ensure that we're building capacity across all um, the across the countries. Um, the CPD, CPA also has an educational platform and we've also within this platform, which includes it's all online um, you can get access and then there's tracking and the certificates available. We have used that in the first program on that as a result of the CW Pumps program is the antimicrobial stewardship program, and you can see that there are four um, courses. Um, antimicrobial review, antimicrobial resistance and principles of stewardship, antimicrobial stewardship in community pharmacy and antimicrobial stewardship in hospital programs. And there are quizzes, there are modules within each of those programs, and then there is a certificate at the end of each one. So that each module is independent and you can take the whole program together. It is great to see that we have um, multiple, so over 6,000 or nearly 6,000 pharmacists from across the Commonwealth who already have access to the platform and you are very much welcome to join. I believe believe that we can accept um, non-pharmacists as well um, and my colleague Manjula is leading on that at the moment and that's just an example of the certificate that we get. We're working with the national pharmacy associations to ensure that they also are part of the certificate of completion and also that there is an accreditation through national programs or through relevant um, governments or um, national pharmacy associations or regulatory bodies within each of the countries to support that across and this is for all the whole commonwealth. We also developed a point prevalence training um, this particular training, which was already taking place, but is now available on demand um, focused on the global PPS as well as the WHO PPS methodology, really highlighting the, the, the training for each of those methodology and also 
trying to understand the differences between them and where each one is best suited to use. So um, the global PPS is obviously voluntary, um, while WHO PPS is a requirement at a country level by the Ministry of Health, and they select the hospitals. Um, and both of them focus on antimicrobial use, healthcare stated infections and resistance. Um, and there are pro, um, pro tools available for both of them. Um, WHO requires informed oral or written consent and WHO um, global PPS gives you an immediate feedback once you've validated your data you get an immediate feedback you get slides that you can use immediately within your hospitals to feedback data and for WHO PPS the feedback is at a national level and goes back to the Ministry of Health. There is also a workshop on JESI, which is the Gender Equality and Social Inclusion, and TEF developed this as part of their health partnerships um, uh, uh, project and program of work. However, they have now that this um, this toolkit has now been and uh, will now be used as part of a workshop specific for CWPAMS, and that will take part take place on the fifteenth of July. You should, if you're already a member of Health Partnership, you should have been invited. And for those that are still interested, there may be opportunities to be able to join in those workshops in the in the future. But the really the importance of us considering gender equality and social inclusion in all our projects is really key. And so we want to ensure that all partnerships have some training on this. Um, and to my COVID stewardship animation videos, um, we are currently developing those at the moment, and this is really to provide culturally and contextually appropriate explain animation videos. And we want to ensure that there's no duplication. So we've really, uh, my colleague Jess um, from Inteth has done a good work re researching what's already out there and making sure that we're not duplicating. And we're planning to have four videos. There will be in eight, there will be in English, but eight different accents. Um, as well as other languages within the eight, within the four to eight countries as well. Um, and we're just working through that process now. But the four videos include what is antimicrobial stewardship. And then we have a, 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 another video which will go through a patient experience with antimicrobial resistance. So this will be more of a public facing a video to encourage the importance of prudent antimicrobial use and will build in one health approach within that as well. There's another video on continuum of care, which basically takes through the, the journey through the roles of nurses, doctors, pharmacists, lab lab and microbiology teams, stewardship committees, and the patients. And then there's also a surgical continuum of care as well. And these were all developed through um, colleagues, um, through a focus group discussion with colleagues. I'm just gonna hand over now to Sarah, who's going to present uh, a, another exciting um, training tool that we've developed, which is an antimicrobial stewardship game. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Diane. Can you hear me okay? I'll assume so. Um, I'm now going to tell you about another really exciting resource uh, developed through CPAMS, and this is one I'm particularly excited about. Um, I hadn't actually used educational board games until I got involved with the health partnership scheme about five years ago. Um, introduced me from some health psychologists. There's been a lot of love for health psychologists in the chat. Anyway, they work so well in sub-Saharan Africa in the setting in Mozambique. We actually brought these particular games back to, to use them in Ipswich Hospital. Um, at the time, I did think an antimicrobial stewardship game would just be perfect, uh, but obviously it didn't exist at that time. It was a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, but now through the CPAMS programme, we've actually been able to develop the antimicrobial stewardship game. It, it's funded uh, through the Fleming Fund, through the programme, and it's been developed uh, with focus games. So because of this programme, 200 of these games will be uh, shipped out later this year to our four country uh, partner countries. Um, this is in addition to the online game. And to ensure sustainability of it so it can be supported going forwards, uh, there's, they will also be available uh, to buy and with a buy one, donate one. So for every game purchased, one will be donated to one of the countries that the DHSC's Fleming Fund works in. So the game is for healthcare professionals, although it was initially designed for healthcare professionals in low and middle income countries, it's equally effective in any health or social care setting, including in the UK or elsewhere. Um, so I think if we could start B with a demonstration of the, uh, the digital game, if that's all right.
The Antimicrobial Stewardship Game is a new online educational board game. It's a team game played over Zoom, Skype or Teams. The game has a range of questions divided into categories. Simply choose the questions to play in the game. Play as individuals or in teams. Up to 16 people can play. Divide the groups into teams, give each team a name. When everyone's ready, roll the dice to start. The team token moves around the board and when it lands on a square, a question appears on the screen. The team take a few minutes to discuss the question and decide on an answer. Correct answers win points. It's now the next team's turn to roll the dice and answer questions. If the team lands on a special square, they must answer a case study question. The team shares the answer with the rest of the group, followed by a group discussion. Correct answers win points. The game continues, each team taking turns answering questions. The facilitator encourages group discussions until the first team reaches the finish. The team with the most points wins the game. The Antimicrobial Stewardship Game is engaging, fun and a great learning tool for teams. To find out more about the game, visit our website at www.amsgame.com. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, B. Right, I'm now going to show you the actual board game. So this game comes in a very nice box. It's nice and sturdy for transportation if you need to take it to another setting uh, for training. It has um, a board. Which again, you can take with you to wherever you want to do your your training session, whether that's in, you know, in an educational classroom or it's outside underneath a mango tree, you can get involved with this game anywhere you like. Um, the cards, the question cards and the case study cards also come in boxes. There are plenty of questions, so you can actually play this game many times if you like without having the same questions. Um, and you can also choose the questions depending on uh, on your audience. So if you're if you're training some microbiologists, you may wish to choose slightly more complex questions than if you're um, than if you're perhaps training the the hospital porters uh, or the support staff. But it's open to the entire multidisciplinary team, whether they're nurses, doctors, pharmacists, students. Everybody is involved in this game. It's really engaging and inclusive, and it's fun. So it generates discussion for what is actually a really serious purpose and the players discuss collectively and individually what they can do to tackle this huge problem uh, because we're all, all part of the solution. Um, there are rules um, and you can go to a QR code to, to produce feedback, etc. It also even has things like a timer and it's got little counters and a dice. It's really rather marvelous. So um, if we could go back to the next slide, please be. Just, uh, just really to thank everybody who's been involved in the, the project. There was a small team um, who, the project team who have put this together over the last few months, but we've sought feedback all the way along from colleagues in many countries not only the ones uh, that we're donating the, the 20 games to. Um, and if you'd just like to go on to the final slide, please. So if you want to find out more about this game, if you go to the website, you can register your interest to order a game when they become available. Um, obviously the, the people involved in the partnerships will have them donated and you can also access the digital game. Thank you very much, back to you, Diane. Thank you so much, Sarah. Just an amazing um, presentation of the of the game. And um, yes, we're very excited about, about the game and we hope that you will find this useful. Um, as Sarah said, it's another um, opportunity um, to vary the way we train um, healthcare workers and, and we um, the great experience of how that works. Uh, and just 
um, just to highlight as well, and just very quickly to summarize, and I think, um, and I know that Vicky showed this earlier, so for those of you who were on earlier, you would have seen this, is that through this all, for us, relevance, effect, effect, effectiveness, impact, efficiency, and sustainability has been a core part of what we've been thinking about. And we're really pleased that when um, the program was evaluated, it scored 82, which meant very good. Um, and um, in terms of relevance, effectiveness, um, impact, efficiency, and sustainability. And you can see the individual scores there. We're working through the process of how we can make the program even more efficient, um, but we're really great that, um, the, 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 that the impact is high. And, and to do this, there was a range, you know, this was done through an um, assessment of the the reports that um, the partnerships submitted to, to TEF and CPM, this was independently assessed by the Ingentian, te Ingentian team. And they also then had um, interviews with colleagues um, from the different partnerships, really to get an understanding of how, what the impact of the program has been. Um, again, we've shown the bi-directional. We, we're really grateful for the bi-directional learning. We talk about the, the alcohol hand drop as one classic example, but we know through our assessment and our evaluation of the fellowship that um, the fellows, um, uh, uh, particularly because those are the ones that we, we could um, formally ask, and we've gone through the volunteers as well, really felt that they learned a lot and the resilience through COVID um, was, was quite strong for those who had been able to have an opportunity to be out in in, um, in, in country in one of the four countries. Um, it, uh, Vicky highlighted this earlier, so I'm not going to go into details here, but just to say that we're grateful to all the partnerships for the amazing work done for over 10,000 training days, more than 3,000 healthcare workers on a very, very low um, programmatic budget. Um, so, so really grateful for, for that support and that um, passion that um, has been shown throughout. Um, we're grateful that there are now, you know, con guidelines and protocols within these institutions, revised documents, and also 80% of institutions introducing the principles of the WHO aware categories, which is really important for antimicrobial stewardship. Great to see that the uh, medicines and therapeutic committees, empowering champions, all have occurred as a result of CW PAMS. We'll be discussing sustainability in the next, in the workshop that's coming up. So we really look forward to seeing how we can ensure that these um, amazing progress that we've made um, are sustained for years to come. I will put into the chat now some resource, the links to some of those resources I, I highlighted and I'll hand it back to Vicky now, thank you. Thanks Diane and Sarah. Um, fantastic overview of the, the technical input there um, to the CWPAMS programme that um, CPA and pharmacists around the Commonwealth are supported in, in partnership with, with SET of course and um, just to um, sort of highlight, Diane's just put some resources in, in the chat box there, but I think that um, we are um, in the process of developing um, a page on the SETS Pulse platform and also on our own website, website which will showcase some of those resources. So um, if you have missed it for any reason, I'm sure that we, you will be able to access it in, in those places in, in the future. Um, Diane, it was also great to see the diverse range of interventions that the partnerships have developed um, during your, your talk. It's really, really impressive and um, also really fantastic to see the publications the partnerships have, have done um, on their work um, in order to disseminate their findings and share further the impact of CPAM. So well done, everyone. And, you know, um, again, this achievement during a pandemic, not only have you done fantastic projects you've managed to publish whilst also, you know, being keys to support the COVID response in the UK. Um, it's, it's really phenomenal and it just highlights the, the passion and the, um, you know, how much um, our pharmacists have really kind of thrown themselves into this. And um, so, so well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. There have been 14 publications um, as a result. And that's just so far, isn't it? There's more um, coming, yeah. I think it's fantastic. So um, Sarah and Diane, you, you highlighted um, very well the immense amount of work that's been done and um, also summarised the valuable tools and resources there that, that have been produced as part of the, the programme, um, and which we hope will be continued into the next phase and will be a fantastic legacy piece um, for the initial CPAMS programme, which we hope will continue in some shape or form in, in the years to come, but more, more about that later. I won't, I won't um, 
ruin the um, surprises. Um, but um, yeah, so the, ne the next session that we are going to move into uh, really follows on from that around sustaining changes. And Diane and Sarah are gonna be helping to lead that. Um, and they're gonna be joined by um, Fran Garagan, who's our, uh, one of our newer recruits. Um, she was um, one of our Chief Pharmaceutical Office, Officers Global Health Fellows, and she's now um, Senior Technical AMS Advisor for the CPA. Um, so I think that are going to put you into some breakout rooms to discuss um, how we're going to um, sustain some of the fantastic interventions that you've made um, in the partnerships. Um, and then we'll come back to the main room um, to feedback on these, um, probably around about 10.50. Um, is, is that right, Beth? Because I know we're running a bit behind time, but I'll let the um, in-room in leads kind of um, direct the, um, the timing of this. Okay, so um, you should be able to see you're being invited to breakout rooms now. Um, if you just click on the link and then we'll see you back in the main room shortly. Thank you. Um, and Fran as, Fran as well in our room. Um, so we had many of the same um, facilitators or, or things that sort of facilitated the project. Um, particularly around planning. So looking to really maximize the time that we had sort of during the face-to-face -face visits and contact time there, because um, I think that's really beneficial having that face-to-face -face time. So um, putting in plenty of planning in the lead up to those visits really helped maximize the time there. Um, having that trust in your partners and that trust going both ways um, within the partnerships was really important to allow the work to happen and allow for um, um, everyone to sort of just get on with their own jobs within the partnership. So that trust was really important. Um, engaging with the Ministry of Health, so making sure that um, they were aware of the work going on and that we'd sort of ticked all the boxes that needed to be ticked and observed all the necessary red tape to make sure that we could um, do the work that we needed to do and you know um relying on our partners to guide us as to what that was and what needed to be done because they knew within their own countries what what uh, was necessary to facilitate the work um taking advantage of all the opportunities so the other the other group spoke about sort of maximizing on the sort of branches of the project that arise and really you know jumping on those opportunities and maximizing them when they came about um, virtual meetings, so I think COVID's highlighted the ability to work in a more virtual capacity and um, look at how we can do things differently to try and maintain some momentum when we aren't able to, um, we aren't able to uh, um, go on the international visits. And then handing over um, between staff, so that was something that actually came about when we were talking about the barriers. So um, what the last barrier on the right-hand side is high staff turnover within some of the um, Commonwealth um, hospitals and uh, sort of to mitigate against that, having a really robust handover between the staff um, before they uh, move on um, and having some of the elements of the projects embedded into sort of training and induction to the hospitals has really helped to mitigate against that. Some of the other barriers, um, so frequent stock shortages, that's something that's sort of um, across all of the Commonwealth countries, um, the sort of limited access to certain antibiotics and um, short dates on those antibiotics, that has presented a huge challenge and an ongoing challenge um, to good AMS work. Um, the pull on the resources in country, so when we were there doing the PPS and things like that, that does pose quite a big pull on resource and it was we were very reliant on the goodwill of staff to sort of give up their own time, move their own duties around. And um, we sort of made the comparison to the NHS. W would that have been possible or achievable in the same way within an NHS institute compared to the Commonwealth institutes? Because it did rely on people um, giving up their own time to do it. Um, um, lots of projects going on in the same country. So some countries had more than one partnership. And sometimes I think that work could feel a little bit fractured and divided and sort of trying to unite those projects and um, communicate more within country as to the work going on in different areas. And then the short term nature. So um, 
ultimately the the whole thing was I think 18 months from start to finish um which feels like a long time when you're there but in the grand scheme of things is only a snapshot and it's making sure that the work we've done doesn't stop at the end of that 18 months and it's ongoing and has some longevity to it Uh, thank you. So the impact of COVID-19. Um, so I think travel is one of the main ones, and that's the first thing that jumps to mind. So um, we have found ways to work virtually and work without the travel, but I think everybody agreed that was an essential part of this to build those relationships and sort of do the boots on the ground work is traveling between those sites, um, particularly for one of the partnerships. Um, there was quite a lot of work done during the project around the lab staff. So we were increasing potentially the amount of tests that were going to be sent to the lab. So we were making sure the lab had the appropriate support and that involved a, a trip for the microbiology staff from um, Tanzania to the UK. And that unfortunately couldn't go ahead. So there were specific elements of the project which couldn't be carried out. Similarly, um, going into the community, um, that was the latter part of one of the projects. And that's unfortunately been put on hold. But both of those things, everyone agreed with things we were keen to pick up on when we were able to. Um, the ability to show behavior change. So um, it, it's, it's uh, COVID has impacted on our ability to collect data and analyze change because we've changed the way we worked as a result of COVID. So that impact has been difficult to change and uh, to gauge. But as a positive, it's definitely showed us how, what we can do remotely and what we can do without um, necessarily being able to visit the countries. And then um, I think we all agreed it's massively opened the door for pharmacy, this work. Um, it's shown the individual pharmacists that they have the ability to change things and given them the confidence and empowered them to enact those changes. It's also showcased to others that pharmacists can do it as well. Um, so it's definitely opened doors for everyone involved. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Joe. That was a really good summary. Um, and it, it, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of the partnerships probably share a lot of the uh, points that, that you've um, brought up there, but it's really interesting to kind of see from different rooms what people's perspectives have been. Um, so, um, Diane, can I hand over to your room uh, for your feedback as the final room? Is that okay? Thank you. Just, um, I'll share my screen very briefly. Um... Uh, great set of slides from the other room. Ours is a bit, I've, we were just typing away, so we've got a bit more um, text feel. So I think we asked for examples of um, projects that had been sustained through the, um, you know, beyond funding. And one example that I was given was from Nigeria and the globe where they had funding from and apologies if i get this wrong but please correct me um colleagues from nigeria they had funding from global fund to uh, for a national program for supply chain um not change supply chain in nigeria um and this started around for tb and malaria but over time extended to primary health care and i think one of the keys for success was the persistent and consistent promotion with stakeholders really and also the grassroots approach of getting people um, in, involved and part owners of any processes or any um, interventions that are developed. And so it went from national to state to local government. So that really has enabled the sustainability to continue, even though the funding has stopped. Um, this was highlighted earlier, but I just wanted to explain it, what they meant by the community level engagement. So this um, came from Ghana, where within some of the partnerships, they had really built engagement with at the community level so with with members of the community so um with the with the local leaders and really helping them to understand what the benefits of the program are and so for example with ipc that can be leveraged further and they found that because the community leaders were invested and knew the reason for this they could continue to champion um the the program and the projects continuing um thinking about low-hanging fruit again ipc came up within that in terms of you know the which was then leveraged for covid but also how can the app be sustained so the antimicrobial prescribing app how can you sustain that can be used as a way to sustain um changes with antimicrobial um stewardship there was a call 
for expanding the CPD um, to other professionals um, and the importance of engaging other professionals and which we are very much um, thinking about um, over time. In terms of CPW PAMS opening doors for pharmacy um, in Ghana, one, and again, this probably links back to sustainability in a way, um, is that um, in Ghana, um, those colleagues who continue to be part, who are part of the program and continue to be part of the program, the Pharmacy Council will award CPD points for them as part of their re-registration process. Um, and then in Tanzania, the, the, the um, increasing of clinical pharmacy um, within that and um, support providing mentorship uh, for pharmacists, which links back to the to the leadership program that we're talking about. Um, but in Tanzania, they have felt more empowered and much more recognized within the hospital and on an a national level. So CW Pharmacy has certainly opened the doors. We had um, the, we couldn't get through to everyone within the um, within the um, on the call um, but during the, our session. But some of these points are highlighted here. I could see colleagues um, agreeing to them within the chat as well from other countries. Thank you. If colleagues can please help stop, okay, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> okay, thanks, Diane. Um, some great points there as well. And I think, um, you know, all of this has highlighted the importance of that multi-stakeholder engagement. Um, and I think one of the things that we've taken into account for and perhaps future programs is the need for more community involvement as well and I think I think that's kind of come through um, but also you know the resilience of the teams that um, have you know continued despite a pandemic um, and I think um, you know I've said this many times but I do think that that's really commendable and um, I hope that pandemics cause challenges but also perhaps opportunities for us to kind of um, you know, maybe do things differently in the future, or as people have pointed out, we've realised how much we can do remotely, and perhaps it's brought people closer um, in that respect. Okay, so um, I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, um, but we're going to have um, a short break now. So can I ask if um, you just want to kind of um, have a quick break and come back in, um, should we say it's 10 minutes? Okay, so 20 past, so we'll be, we'll be a bit behind time, but I think everyone could do with a 10 minute break. We won't go into breakout rooms, um, but at this time, can I also remind you about the um, evaluation form? I think Bee's just gonna post that um, in the chat box. Um, if you haven't already filled that in, um, please could you do that? Um, it will also be emailed out to you after the event if you do miss it but we really appreciate your feedback and it helps us to um, take that into account for future events that we might do. So without further ado, I'll let you go and get your coffees.